policy and the heart leadership program that uh, Professor Peck directs now. And, um, and so everything she's uh, done, uh, we, we claim. Uh, yeah, um, uh, you probably know the outlines of her biography, but it really is an extraordinary American story. Uh, Kathy uh, came here with her family uh, at, the age she, at the age of two as a refugee uh, from Vietnam. Um, her family had uh, left Vietnam and was seeking to go somewhere, and I think spent some time, had some other opportunities, but, the, but, but really dreamt of coming to America and were able to do so And when she was two years old. Um, and, uh, you know, only a, is sort of the, there's a kind of only in America story here that someone can come as a refugee, at, at, you know, with nothing, at, in, in, in fam, no family background, and, and, and work hard and, and, and get into Duke <laughs> and, and then get a master's at Michigan and, um, and, and, and be a professional and then, and then make this extraordinary decision to run for office. Um, your fourth child, which is, yeah. <laughs> which is just unbelievable, um, and run for office in Virginia uh, and, and win and be the first uh, Vietnamese American in the Virginia House of Delegates, I think one of two uh, Asian Americans uh, in, in the, uh, who were elected for the first time in the, in the Virginia House of Delegates and was elected in 20, 2017. And, and now represents a um, district in Northern Virginia and um, uh, in the Virginia House of Delegates. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, to me, that's, it's, it is the American story in, the, in, 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 in so many ways. And one that I, I'm the son of an immigrant, so it resonates uh, very, very much with me as well. Um, and so it's, uh, it's just a little bit of background of, of, of because, because that history, of course, colors and affects the role she, Kathy, now plays in, um, in Virginia and politics and public life um, in many ways. Um, so it's just a, a real pleasure to have you back here at Duke, and, and thank you so much for doing it and having taken the time to talk with us today. Um, I'll do it. I, I, I was just doing a little bit of an interview here, but we, you know, we're, we're not a large group, so we'll be very informal, I think, and have a conversation. Um, it's just such an opportunity um, to, to talk with, with, with Kathy, and we could start anywhere. There's so many things to, to cover, but I, you know, the, the sort of obvious first question is, what, what made you decide to run for office <laughs> um, <laughs> after all of uh, A lot of sleepless nights with a brand new newborn, and, and we <laughs> arrived at, this is what I'm going to do on my maternity leave, but really I think that the, so I just want to say, you know, I'm really excited to be here. By, I met my husband here at Duke. Duke is such an important part of our lives. And on our drive down, we were trying to just tease out, you know, what we learned here and how did that kind of influence our life's path. Um, and, uh, and it's really hard to, right? It just has, it just is who we are. Um, and so uh, super delighted to be here with you. And I thank you for spending your time with us on a Friday morning um, before homecoming. But I think the, the, the journey to running for office really began in, at the presidential election of 2016. And I didn't know it then because it was never kind of in my cards to be a politician um, and to run for office. And so, um, but in 2016, you know, I was pregnant with my fourth child. And after that uh, election, it was just really kind of stunning. Um, and it was really, discouraging for Nat and myself. And just kind of thinking through that night even. Um, you know, uh, Fritz has talked a little bit about kind of my history coming here. And so, um, you know, when I think about kind of my life's journey and what that moment meant on election night, uh, you know, my parents, at the end of the Vietnam War, my dad was sent to a re-education prison. And, he was there for a couple of years, and when he was released, my parents were like, we don't have a future under this oppressive regime, and we really need to leave. And so, like many people before and after them, they made that decision to risk everything they had, right, for hope, opportunity, and freedom. And 
uh, and we see that now, and I know we'll talk about it a little bit later, about kind of the immigrant and refugee situation that we're facing, not just in this country, but I think worldwide. And um, so I know, you know, I knew what my parents had risked to get us to America. I knew what all the hard work that they had put into their life's work. Um, and so to see the results of, of election night in 2016 was extremely discouraging. And to know that not just kind of my family had, had gone through those uh, trials, you know, Matt also has family that, um, that left kind of a very anti-Semitic Europe um, and had started over in America. And so, you know, here we are expecting this brand new life and, you know, kind of juxtaposing both of that. And we decided that uh, for us, what was really important was that this baby was gonna have a name that reflected our values kind of in this moment. Like kind of for us, it was really important. We actually said to ourselves, we think this is gonna be a resistance name. Mm -hmm. um, but we decided to name the baby Elise Minkun. And Elise was inspired by Ellis Island. So Matt has family that passed through Ellis Island as they were escaping anti-Semitism and began their lives in America. Minkan is Vietnamese for Bright Bell, and that was inspired by the Liberty Bell. And to us, her name means to ring the bells of liberty and champion opportunity for all. And so we had her. You know, I was due with her on Inauguration Day. She came a couple of days later, thank goodness. Um, and then she was a month old when I decided to run because I realized I couldn't spend all my time sitting on the couch, you know, crying over what was happening. And, mm -hmm. and if you recall back in the first, you know, month, six weeks of the Trump administration, a lot happened, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we made the decision to run. It was really important to, to, to both of us that all of our kids knew that we were gonna do everything we can, right? As our country is facing these moments of crisis, which has totally borne out that we were gonna do everything we can for them. And so I decided to run and took the whole family with me. I mean, they were all like parts of our campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been great. So yeah. did you enjoy, uh, well, tell us about the run. Did you, what was, was, did you enjoy it? Was it, what was surprising? What was difficult? What did you like about sure. it? What didn't you like about it? Has, who in here has thought about running for office or thinks you will, think, think, think you will in the future? That's awesome. That's awesome. I have one big grin, no, definitely not. A big grin, which I think is a maybe, but doesn't want to admit it publicly. A couple of hands. So I never, I never raised my hand, right? Like, I never thought about it. Because for me, like, politicians, you know, small p is like, kind of like a bad word, right? Like, being a bureaucrat. Um, and I ended, I was a bureaucrat for 12 years, uh, so I can say that. But, like, who wants to be a politician, right? And all kind of the baggage that goes with that. Um, and I didn't know anything about running, like, at all. And actually, my... My uh, Noah Kim, who ended up being my campaign manager, was I interviewed a campaign manager, and he was interviewing me, and I didn't even realize that. And he was like, "How do you feel about fundraising? Have you ever raised money before?" And I was like, "No, I don't know. I've never had to sell a box of Girl Scout cookies. I don't know. Like, I guess I'll be okay um, uh, at all." Much the same thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it all worked out, uh, but it is a lot of work, and it is it is a job, right? Like. There's you as like an individual and who you are. There's you as a candidate, and you really have to work at it. Like, um, and it's, uh, but it is was such an incredible experience to just talk to people in the community in a very different way, right? Like, there's no reason for me to go and knock on, you know, the person who lives across the street's house and be like, "What is it that you care about?" And I want to hear about that. And I want to see how I could help you, right? And to have those conversations was really incredible and really inspiring. Um, but it's a lot of work, and right now, there are a lot of different organizations that are set up to help people run for office. Um, and I think if you're thinking about it, go and, you know, go to one of those trainings. There's organizations for women, of, uh, the, you know, who will train women across the political spectrum, organizations focused specifically on women of each party as well, women of color, people of color, LGBTQ candidates, like all, different types of organizations. And I say do it because it demystifies the process. Mm -hmm. Like, what does it take to be a good candidate? What does it take to run a strong campaign? How do you fundraise? There's really no magic to it. It's the same formula and they'll all tell you it. But it just helps you become comfortable with the process. So I took that training. Um, I did a boot camp with Emerge Virginia. They train Democratic uh -huh. women. Emerge America is a national organization, but in Virginia, and um, they have a chapter and they train Democratic women for office, uh, to run for office. And it was, 
Fantastic. Um, so you get the whole, like, what is, what is it to be a successful candidate and have a successful campaign? And at the same time, I think what's equally, if not more important, is just getting connected to other candidates. Because this is a crucible like none other, and you don't know what it's going to be like until you go through it. And honestly, unless you live with somebody who is in it in that moment, it's really hard to even explain, right? And so it was really important that I got to meet a, just a fantastic group of women who I now, many of whom I now serve with, um, and to be able to go through that process with them, that was really important. That's great. So if any of you are interested, uh, we'll be running a, a, a program for women who think they might want to run for office. Fantastic. with uh, running a, the third such program we've done, Running yeah. Start. BJ, what's it? November 10th. November, November 10th. Yeah. Saturday, um, uh, half day session with them, and they, we've done two of these so far. They've been very well attended. That's uh, awesome. Uh, for our students and young alums, okay. or any alums that would be, uh, who are interested, uh, think they might be interested in running for office. That's awesome. So that's that's great. So, um, so you won. So I won. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're in the. House of uh, Delkins, and so uh, uh, we could talk about some particular issues that you've sort of taken on as your yeah. signature, but just for starters, you know, just uh, how, is that, how has that been? I mean, what's surprising to you about mm -hmm. what, what is what you expected, what is not what you expected sure. about the experience of being, actually being in the House of Delegates? Um, so if, if, did any of you follow the Virginia elections in 2017? Raise your hands, right? So we were, 66, 34, 66 Republicans, 34 Democrats. And then you head into 2017, right? People knew there was this energy across the country, um, kind of, ha you know, about a year and a half into the Trump administration. But nobody knew how that was gonna play out in Virginia. And we're, we in New Jersey have these off-year elections. We have an election every year in the state. Um, and so nobody knew how that was gonna play out. And what happened though was, uh, you know, they thought maybe we could gain like five to seven seats would be a banner win, right? So we won 15 seats. We flipped 15 Republican held seats. And my seat was held by Republican for 24 years, mm -hmm. who I think read the tea leaves and actually stepped down. So it was an open race and considered one of the most competitive opportunities for Democrats to win in, um, in 2017. But we flipped 15 seats and we also had a new freshman um, from a previously dem uh, held Democrat seat that person had stepped down for a different uh, office. And so we had 16 new freshmen. Mm -hmm. And that was like really incredible. So we went from 6634 to 5149. Um, and you might, if you were following in 2017, remember we had a race that was decided literally by picking somebody's name out of a hat right. uh, because it was tied um, on election, basically on election night. And then the recount for lots of different reasons ended up being tied. And so we had a, you know, the Republican incumbent won because his name was drawn out of a hat. Um, and so it's hard for me to say what it was like before because I wasn't yeah, there, yeah. but all the incumbents say that things changed pretty dramatically because suddenly we had a very strong voice at the table. But I think for me, you know, when, when it was obvious that we were going to be 5149 in the beginning of January, it was like, it was very naive because I was like, oh, I just have to win two votes, right? I just have to win two votes in order to pass my bills. And I put it forward, I thought, you know, you kind of think through your, your political, your legislative agenda and the strategy for passing bills. And I thought I put forward a couple of like very common sense bills. Um, things that were, were where you could build a broad coalition on both sides. And we were able to do that. We just didn't get the votes. And what I realized is it's not two votes. Like, do you want to be the two people who jump ship from your team like and give give a freshman a win, give a Democrat a win? I don't think so. <laughs> and so you really have to, if you look at that, you know, you really have to bring over 10 to 12 votes. And actually not, none of the Democratic bills, I think, won, you know, passed without like a huge majority, either like either unanimously or very close to it, like, you know. So we have 100 delegates. And so, um, and I think that that is really, that's really interesting, and I think what, it's surprising because you know you go through the campaign and then you put on a legislator hat mm -hmm. is thinking about that political strategy mm -hmm. and thinking about all the small p politics that goes into mm -hmm. being able to pass bills right mm -hmm. you know we mm -hmm. had this historic incoming class where we broke all different types of barriers in virginia which was really exciting um and you know so there's always kind of like a hazing of freshmen anyway but like i think that really you know 
increased, mm-hmm. right? And so, mm-hmm. and so, and and so, you think about all of the the context about whether or not you can pass a bill that might be common sense. But the other thing I, I want to say, just a little bit, that I found really interesting was, so I'm a mom. So at this point, I mean, uh, of of these four amazing kids, but at this point, my baby is now one. And um, I made the decision to bring her to Richmond with me because I was still a nursing mom and I wasn't going to be away from her for that, you know, that long. Our session is pretty short uh, compared to others, but um, it was 60 days uh, this past year. And so um, to me, it was like, well, of course I'm going to bring her with me. Like how, you know, she never took a bottle. How am I going to leave her at home? And Matt is managing, you know, the other three kids because they're in in school. And, uh, And I think that was very, it was probably a surprising choice to a lot of folks. Um, so, you know, in my office in Richmond, I have a play pen. I have the little, like, thing where the babies, like, put their feet in and they can, like, kind of scoot around. And then there she's scooting around in the hallways, right? And, you know, on moving day, people are like, what is this baby? And, you know, there, she, there I am pushing her around in the carriage. And, but I think, um, so in the beginning, it was kind of like an oddity, right? Like, what, what is she doing? Where is she going yeah. with this baby? Why is this baby in, you know, committee sessions? And and this baby was with me, like, for almost all my meetings in the morning. So she went with me to committee. She sat in on all of my meetings with my constituents, with lobbyists, with stakeholder groups, right? Um, and sometimes she was very quiet, and sometimes she, like, you know, ran she's, around the office. She's really getting a running start. That's she a is. She can That's lead all these trainings. <laughs> but I think that, but that was certainly, I think, a change for Richmond. But it was such um, – I had for anybody who looked at me kind of skeptically, I had probably 10 people who said, this is the most awesome thing to see. Mm-hmm. And um, at the end of session, there were people who came in and were like, I'm here to – you know, we're here to meet. But, but where's your baby? <laughs> and now I'm here, right? Um, she did go, she was in daycare yeah. part-time, but she was on the floor with me enough, you know. And, and uh, now that she's going to be two in January, I think it's, I'll have to rethink that strategy because she's you know, a mobile, loud person. But um, that, I think, was definitely kind of a new thing that happened. And it was also, for me as a mom, something that was a, a very conscious decision that I had you know, to make. I'm curious, just as building on that, I mean, you have, you can sense multiple identities. You're a mother, uh, yeah. you're uh, a Duke alum, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I should have started with that, but, but, but also your, 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 you know, your family history. Yeah. And, and so maybe you can talk a bit about how the, you know, those identities, that history shapes the, the issues you work on and maybe how you work on them. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, there's, there's kind of like Kathy Tran, the legislator that represents the 42nd district. And just to give you a kind of a little bit of a that, and that's a, you know, a very clear hat that I wear all the time now, even when I'm not in session. Um, and so my district is in Fairfax County in Northern Virginia. It is a predominantly white community with both kind of young families like mine, as well as active duty military families, retired veterans and retirees, right? So it's kind of a mix. Um, there's also a strong kind of uh, several strong uh, diverse communities in the in the district as well, um, and also I think the other the other piece I'd love for you to know is we have a lot of amazing treasures. So I have Mount Vernon, uh, George Washington's home. I have George Mason's home, which is um, Gunston Hall. He is the father of the Bill of Rights, um, and I have a state park and four regional parks. So a lot of big kind of green space for being a suburban district. Um, and so I have to think a lot about the issues that my community cares about. You know, the top issue on the doors was making sure we expand access to health care, um, supporting our veterans and military families, having strong public schools, kind of fixing transportation, which in Northern Virginia, like D.C. area, is like one of the worst mm-hmm. spots in the country, right? So those are things that I try to work on um, because I've heard from them, from my constituents, also making sure that we're protecting the environment. It's such an important piece of the district. So knowing my district, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's also a piece that I think, you know, kind of who I am and my background and uh, and history and personal and professional experiences and bringing that to the table. So I try to be very thoughtful, uh, a thoughtful voice in lifting up concerns around immigrant and refugee communities in Virginia and nationally. Um, being a former refugee, um, you know, and, and finding ways to give voice to that is really important to me personally. It's important to my constituents as well. I've heard a lot about making sure that we're supporting and welcoming the stranger, continuing 
our traditions as a country, but um, but but kind of going like kind of like an extra step in thinking mm -hmm. about ways I could do that, both legislatively as well as kind of building that community. Um, and I've been thinking a lot right now, kind of given what's happening across this country with the systematic dismantling of the immigration and refugee resettlement systems, is thinking about what we can do at the state level mm -hmm. and also um, what we can do locally, right? And how do we give voice to, to the, I think, a very strong sense that we must reclaim kind of the soul of our democracy in being a place that offers hope opportunity and freedom for all and that's happening and how do we lift that up particularly in Virginia and um, we had a very anti-immigrant uh, governor's race in 2017 where there was a lot of fear-mongering mm -hmm. and we see some of that still in 20 or 2018 congressional races and you know given what's happening right now I bet you it's gonna happen in 2020 and so I've been thinking mm -hmm. a lot about how do we in Virginia have an affirmative message um, and building that over time not just mm -hmm. in 2020 for the race, uh, the, the presidential race there. So that's definitely an issue that I have been kind of just trying to be very thoughtful about. And then also, you know, giving voice to what it's like to be uh, both a legislator uh, as well as a parent. And how do you balance that and being a mom, you know, very hands-on with all, all of my kids. And, you know, while I brought the baby down, I went home to Richmond probably four out of five nights almost every single week because I wanted to make bedtime with my kids. And that was a trade-off between what I could do, you know, kind of in my off time in Richmond, right? Um, but it was really important to me. And so giving voice to that and helping anybody who wants to run for office, having a lot of conversations with women and moms and women of color who are thinking about running for office and what my experience has been and kind of paying that forward as well. And so those are just a couple of areas that I think when you're thinking about your intersectionality, how that plays out. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, super interesting to think about the uh, your role, particularly on, on, around refugees, at, uh, both at the you know within the state house, but also in a, in a way as a kind of you know, increasingly national figure in that sense, or at least part of a, a conversation nationally. And uh, um, Lord knows we we need that yeah. conversation. Are you hopeful in that? You what 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 is your sense of where we are in that conversation? Or let me ask you this way: when you're when you're talking to people, what? Yeah. You talk to all kinds of people. What what is what are the messages that you find do resonate with people that are effective in, in moving the needle on this issue? Um, you know, I think you know, so. We see this extremely ugly rise in nationalism right now, and we see that playing out in the policies that the federal government is putting forward. Just mm -hmm. this week, Trump announced. It was this week or last week? I'm getting my dates mixed up. But Trump announced, you know. The refugee cap for next year is going to be thirty thousand, which is a historic low since we've had the refugee like act, right? And it's, you know, when you you're looking at like over sixty million people are displaced in the world, over twenty five million people are registered refugees in camps, um, that we're only going to accept thirty thousand. And and I just want to say, um, this year the cap was, I think forty or forty five thousand. We were on by the end of the fiscal year next week. We should accept. A total of like 22. So just because the cap is 30 doesn't mean we're going to accept 30, and that's really discouraging. Um, you know, we see that you saw the separation of families policy, right? And the real kind of the barriers that are now put on into asking for us seeking asylum at our uh, ports of entry. Um, those doors are like really, you know, it's very hard to open right now. Um, you see a systematic kind of uh, attack on you know, family reunification policies and the ability to bring people over, um, you know, on that level as well. So on all these different levels, right? It's, I think, I, I worked in immigration advocacy um, for a period of time, and I think for those folks who are still doing that work day in and day out, I think it's, it's extremely a tough environment. So that's happening. But what I think what gives me a lot of hope is, you know, I knocked on thousands of doors when you campaign, they'll say, you're gonna knock on thousands of doors and you're just like, I don't even know if I can count that high, right? Like, are there that many doors? But you will end up knocking on all those doors. Um, and I had conversations with so many people and, and, and Matt was saying it this morning, my husband did too, and so people would voluntarily say, tell me, right? Like, you know, I wanna tell you about like my parents who came as immigrants, my grandparents, uh, I want to tell you, like, I have this friend or a neighbor who's a former refugee, and I really, really care about them. 
I, my church resettled refugees um, in the 80s. They resettled refugees in the 90s. Um, and uh, I had people tell me about their military service in Vietnam, people who told me they were foreign service officers, asylum officers, like this whole range of people for whom this is such an important issue. And uh, it really became clear to me that these values I had talked about earlier, why my parents came to this country, why so many others also did, um, are truly kind of the foundation of our democracy, right? Like, and I think they are what unites us. And so um, it's so important to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations because we may not agree on any other issue, but we might find that to be a commonality. And I think the continued emphasis on the fact that there is no finite amount of hope or opportunity or freedom in this country, right? This is not, this is not a pie that you have to like, you, there's only so many slices you can give away. And um, I, was, I was just at, <laughs> we, we detoured through Charlottesville last night on our way down here because um, greater, I'm sorry, Welcoming Greater Charlottesville is an, a kind of a movement to lift up the voices of immigrants and refugees in that community. And this is a movement across the country. And um, they were showing a documentary um, featuring some of the refugees from their community. And so I got to speak to them. And I, and I thought what was really amazing is you might remember in August of 2017, there were the neo-Nazi racist marches at UVA. And so you're looking at this community, which is just like 13 and a half months after or 13 months after that march, not just saying like, that's not who we are, but like proudly and loudly proclaiming and loving their immigrant refugee neighbors. And I thought that took so much courage and so much resilience, but you see that happening across the country. So while the federal context is extremely discouraging, the conversations I have with my neighbors and these types of events across the country, I think are very hopeful to me. And, um, and, and I'll end with, you know, on the family separation piece, I think what turned the tide on that was that it was a bipartisan outcry that that was not American, right? And I think that um, when we look at kind of that piece of the heart of who we are as Americans, I think that we will win. And I'm very confident we will. Um, you know, we just got to get through this moment. Yeah, well, like you, I'm pretty passionate about that in issue. And it, it is encouraging to feel that it's, you know, that, that people can still be called by the better angels on this yes. issue. And, um, let me shift gears a little bit, and then I'm going to open up for, for questions uh, from, uh, just to, to, to talk about one other issue. I know you've uh, thought a lot about and involved with, and we're doing a lot here, and that's around the gerrymandering issue. Um, uh, Virginia, like uh, North Carolina, has a long, proud history of gerrymandering, um, and uh, I know you're in a process in Virginia that has some similarities to what we're doing in North Carolina, trying to really to reform the way we draw district lines. So can, you, can you tell us a little bit about sort of where that stands in Virginia and what, 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 you're, what you're trying to accomplish there? So um, uh, just a little bit of context about gerrymandering in Virginia. We, in June, there's been a, a, a long ongoing court case about uh, brought forward uh, by several voters about districts that were gerrymandered in the, after the 2010 uh, census. And so the courts found this June that those districts were racially gerrymandered. So all the African-American voters were packed, right, into 11 districts, and that now we need to unpack those districts um, and make sure that these individuals have a voice um, in their elections. And, uh, and so we're going through the process of trying to remedy that before our next elections, which would be in 2019. Um, and uh, it was really, you know, I'm on the Privileges and Elections Committee, so, you know, the, it's a very partisan issue in that Demo the Democrats were like, you gotta do something. The Republicans were like, we're gonna appeal, appeal, appeal. And so finally the, Democratics, the Democrats in the House, we put forward a map. And um, we had a committee hearing, so I'm on the Privileges and Elections Committee, so I sat it through the committee hearing. That was really, it was just kind of like nasty, right? Like, this is what people don't like about politics. Like, um, and, uh, and it also, just kind of like the, what are you trying to do with these maps? And we're not trying to do anything, you know, kind of the back and forth and suspicious natureness of it because one side drew the maps and the other side was responding. 
Um, well, I'll just say uh, next week we're going to go back to uh, have a committee hearing on the Republican maps, and I'm sure the same conversation will happen, but you know, the players will be switched, right? Because that's what happens when we draw the maps. And, um, and I went into my campaign really believing that we need to have independent commissions, uh, independent nonpartisan commissions draw these maps because it doesn't work if you have an inherent interest, right? Like, um, and, uh, and the committee hearings and this whole process has really played that out for me yeah. um, because, you know, of course, self-preservation, you're like, I would draw, you know, I would draw myself like this and, and you get all these voters and that type of thing. Um, but what in Virginia I think is really interesting is we will not have an independent nonpartisan commission uh, if we don't put it in the Constitution, right? Because then we'll have to vote on the maps and, you know, like, you're, it just won't happen, right? Um, in order for a constitutional amendment to pass in Virginia, you have to have the same amendment pass two sessions with an election in between. Well, luckily, we have an election every year, right? So um, so we would then have to pass, but but what's really important for us in the time frame, right, is to make sure this happens before, you know, 2021 when redistricting starts. So we have to pass it in 2019, then November, so in January 2019, January, February, November we'll have our election, and then it has to pass again in 2020. But, you know, like I said, we're four seats away uh, from flipping the House and the Senate, so we're a Republican majority right now in both chambers. We hope to flip that in 2019, right? So to me, in order to get something in the Constitution, because we want to flip the houses, you are going to have some, an, an amendment has to pass in a Republican held chamber, a uh, Republican held General Assembly, and then it has to pass again in a Democratic held General Assembly, and you can't even change a comma, right? Like it's the exact wording has to pass all three times. Mm -hmm. So you really have to have mm -hmm. some bipartisan yeah. consensus, mm -hmm. and it's really important that we figure that out. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm still getting, I'm getting up to speed mm -hmm. on all the different models yeah. of all the different ways mm -hmm. you can do this, but. Uh, it's just clear to me, you know, it, it shouldn't be us. And I think what was really telling, so we had this like two and a half hour hearing um, that was very contentious. And finally, somebody stood up, you know, in the public comment period and she said, these are not your districts, right? This is not trans yeah. district. This is not my, you know, this, these are yeah. our districts. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and I'm right. like, you're right. Like, you know, because people were like, you just cut me out of my district type of thing. And um, so I'll just say what's really interesting is I live, you know, two miles away from the delegate in the next district. And so if we look at 2021, if you're really redrawing lines and Northern Virginia population has exploded and it all changes, like you should not be preserving the 41st and the 42nd district just because two sitting delegates sit there, right? Like you really need to be thinking about the communities. Um, but I, I just want to say like, how many of you, oh, first I have to ask, how many of you know exactly what gerrymandering is and why it's important? Okay, good, awesome. So I yeah. won't give you that spiel because they're probably all <laughs> yeah, your we, students, we, right? Yeah, we, we, well, we, we proselytized so, yes. a fair amount around, and it's been in the news. I mean, yeah. it is bad. If you'd asked that question two yeah. years ago, right. would have been very few hands. Yeah. So it's really interesting to so. see gradually gerrymandering yes. becoming an issue that people are aware yes. of, and potentially, and this is the heart of it, can you make it a, an election issue? That is to say, right. can you can you hold them to the yeah. commitment that they make yeah. while running, yeah, yeah. Yeah. that they will, like the yeah. Democrats, can you get them to pledge that right. they, you know, if we win, we will, well, we will do X, we will do X yeah. and, and hold them to that, and that yeah. depends a lot on, a lot of, you know. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I just want to, I think like, just on this, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's such a like, it's like you, you have to be like a policy wonk to kind of thread the needle as to how you get from gerrymandering all the way down to like my reproductive health rights, right? And, and the long-term effects of these districts and these votes. And, but it's, to me, kind of like the quintessential issue that we must be talking about because it has such ramifications across the board. And it's how do you tell that story so that somebody who might not be in a public policy you know, program or is not super engaged all the time in politics can understand why it's so important. And like, you're just your average person, average voter type of thing um, is so important. But I think like when we talk about access to, you know, when we talk about like one voice, one vote issues, like gerrymandering, um, campaign finance reform and voter access are the three-legged stool of 
and the census are my four-legged stool that you really need to be talking about, right? Because without all of those pieces coming into, you know, to in, in the fitting into the puzzle, like it's really hard to say then that we actually have like one voice, one vote in this country. I do want to open the question, but I did want to ask you one more thing, so, uh, uh, um, which is, 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 is this, I mean, there are, uh, and it comes back to the conversation we were having earlier, there are an extraordinary number of women running for office yeah. this year, and, and still uh, alive, uh, many, uh, that is to say, uh, an, an, an unprecedented number yeah. have won their primaries yeah. in, around the country. Uh, we'll see what happens in the general election, but it, you know, there's a good chance that there will be a substantial increase at the national level in women yeah. serving state legislatures yep. and governorships in the, in the U.S. Congress. And why does that matter? So it's just extremely important that our governments reflect the diversity of our communities, right? Everybody brings a certain, uh, you know, unique experiences and perspectives when you do your work, whatever your work is. And if your work is lawmaking, you know, all of that context just plays into it. And I talked a little bit earlier about kind of the lens through which I view the world as a former refugee, as, as somebody who's worked in immigration, worked in workforce development as a mom and why that's really important and understanding how our laws affect the lives of regular everyday people across, you know, the diverse experiences we have in America is so important. But I think, what, you know, to answer that question right now is if you looked at the Judiciary com uh, Committee in the Senate, right, like there's not a single woman in there. And when uh, Dr. Ford is going to, you know, when she does testify, like that's un absolutely unbelievable that that's the situation she'll be in. And I think that is just kind of an example and a, a very telling example of why we need to have more women in office. Um, we need to make sure our voices are heard. And I think right now what you feel is that, I mean, women are just like amazing. Uh, women are running election, you know, they're running. <laughs> let's, let's just acknowledge that, right? Women are not just running um, for office. We are the backbones of campaigns. We are the backbones yes. of the Moms Demand movement. We are the backbone of, you know, all sorts of really tremendous efforts right now to, to win back our country. And, um, Many of us are doing that juggling work, juggling family responsibilities, juggling parent responsibilities, you know, older parents, all sorts of things. It's incredible. And that sheer willpower is just going to push us forward, right? And so um, I just think it's so important that where we're, you know, at least half the population that we need to be those voices at the table. Um, and so, yeah. Amen. Um, let's, let's open for questions. What would, what, Zach, do you? Um, you said that your four-legged stool, whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, what what do you think needs to be done about the census? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so one of the biggest issues around the census right now is the proposal to include a question on naturalization. Right. Um, so that it, you know. Uh, creates a lot of anxiety among immigrant communities for I think some very obvious reasons and the the potential that those individuals are not going to complete the census is very real and so then you'll have an undercount which means all the federal and many states put their state resources against census data businesses make decisions using census data like all these decisions that are really important to the growth of our communities and to the resources that are available to serve people are dependent upon census data. So when it's not, and also representation, right? Like both the House of Representatives and so many of the state legislatures use the census data um, as key um, input into drawing district lines. Like all of that um, and the legitimacy of it is at stake. And so um, there are a number of different lawsuits right now around the naturalization question. Um, so I think there's a short and a long-term game. So in the short term, like, you know, and, and there's a, oh, I can't remember the name, but a, a terrific, uh, the NPR correspondent who's following this has just kind of untracked a lot of evidence that this is, was not something that was recommended by um, the st statisticians and other scientists in the census and wasn't requested by DOJ and, and stuff like that, right? So as that kind of winds its way through and hopefully the courts will throw out that question, um, you know, if that doesn't happen, 
then the long-term game, though, is everybody needs to complete the census. And so we've been asked questions like, should I tell my communities to lie on the census? Should I tell communities to skip that question? What should we do? Okay, you can't lie on the census. Like, there's an actual, um, you can get, like, not, uh, like, a fee, right? Um, there's a, you can get fined if you lie, on, and they find out that you lie, you purposely lied on the census. And, you know, given the environment that we're in, I wouldn't put it past this administration to hold up a couple of examples of people who lied on the census and find them and tried them in public court, and then what you have is a lot of people then not completing it, right? So it's really important we complete the census if that question remains. Mm -hmm. Census data is supposed to be like kind of super top secret. You sign your life away when you have access to it so that it shouldn't be used against you. Um, and there's a lot of education that has to go forward then in terms of letting people know about the security of the data, why they need to complete it, why it's so important to answer these forms and things like that. But um, short term, uh, you know, game would be to, to win these court cases. Long term game is just no matter what's in the census is to complete it. Great. Yes. Kelsey. Oh, um, so you talked before about the 60 day session. And yes. so, for Jenny, correct me if I'm wrong, is a part time legislature. Yes. Yeah. So, the, you know, the issues you're talking about, this is all like a big lift. And so, I was wondering if you could talk about like the challenges and also maybe the benefits of a part time legislature and like how that affects. Oh, so it's really incredible. We, we had like over 3,000 bills in 60 days, uh, which is like, you know, you don't, you know, as it goes through the, winds through itself through the committee sy system and, and the process, like you don't review all 3,000, but it's like an incredible number of bills that are put forward. So I don't think it's, it's not enough time to be very thoughtful, right, in the policy making and the law making. Uh, we are thoughtful, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just not enough time. Um, and then in odd year, odd year session, so in 2019, our, our session's only 45 days, right? And, but then we have a cap on the number of bills we can put in, we can only put in 15. Um, but uh, but I've, I've heard in Georgia, I think they have a shorter session, but you can put in as many as you want. Anyway, so I, all that to say, though, it's a part-time legislate, legislature, but it's a full-time position yeah. in that sense, right? Like, I serve my community year-round. It's not like at the end of February, I'm like, I will not help you with any other issue, right? So. We, um, so that, that, so lawmaking is only one piece of being a delegate, right? The other piece are all the constituent services I provide, and in Virginia, um, I, you know, I live in a county, I don't live in a city or a town, and there's big distinctions in Virginia, but because I live in a county, uh, the state owns all the roads, so I help you, I tell people I help you with everything from potholes to like big policies, right? So we're co constantly um, making sure that we're staying in, you know, providing constituent services. Uh, I hold, I'm, by the end of this year, I'll have, I think, I think I'll think i either have hosted or have held or participated in 11 town halls. I have monthly office hours. I put out, you know, a kind of in the summer, a, a periodic newsletter. During session, I do it every week. So like a lot of engagement with the community and still trying to keep a pulse on what's happening. Um, and then I work on my bills during the summer, right? So I have meetings with stakeholders. I'm, I have a, I'm very hopeful about a net metering bill I have on green energy, but like, you know, working my bills and, and trying to build broad-based coalitions um, around them. So to me, um, you have to, when you, you know, particularly because we're in the minority and also even when we're in the majority, you wanna make sure that you're bringing in voices from the left and the right as much as possible um, to, to show kind of a diverse, support for these uh, policy ideas, right? So like building those coalitions. So all of that is happening. Um, so sometimes a part of me is like, well, it's good that we're actually only in session for a short time so I could do all this other work. Um, but, but other times it's like, there's just not enough time during session to, to think through every single bill that, um, that is introduced, right? Does that make sense? Um, so I think there's pros and cons to it. Um, and so also the pay in Virginia is, uh, you know, across the states for um, the state legislatures, like just varies. In Virginia, a uh, delegate makes about $17,000, less than $18,000, right? Um, so I always tell my aide, you know, you make more than me, <laughs> right? So it's not a full time salary because it's considered a part time job. But yeah, 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 it's not minimum wage. But um, so many of us have other jobs. Um, I stepped out of the workforce when I had the baby before I decided to run. Um, but you know, for my colleagues who are juggling a full-time or even a part-time job, I try to imagine how they do it because, you know, being a delegate can take up, like, all my time. Um, 
So that that is a uh, that's kind of all that there is that you're balancing when you head into a state legislature. Thanks so much, Kathy. Just oh. a lot of like, just lots of questions for Bill. I'm just going to ask one, make a quick comment because I think um, what I so appreciate above and beyond what you're bringing to the work, the way you're linking your intimate life and your public life in a way that is really uh, not only exemplary but just kind of mind-blowingly uh, it, it inspires hope. It really does. Like you can do that. You're creating a new model, not only of, of representation to me, but like how you do it. On the immigration question, okay. Um, I have a kind of this is just a comment, and then I guess the, the question is the comment is I, not to it's not to assign blame, but I think for too long, advocates of refugees, and this includes a lot of liberals uh, and, and good-hearted people, have defined the interest in the refugee question solely in humanitarian mm -hmm. global terms and not in a kind of strategic national way. And that is actually facilitated in inadvertently the rise of the kind of nativist uh, politics that we see in Donald Trump, where the only national interest in refugees to borrow them entirely. So what you're describing, down to 30,000, it is people, liberals and, and conservatives alike supported making this the refugee was we accepted two thirds of the planet's refugees between 1945 and 1990. That's just staggering. That was bipartisan. Conservatives saw the national interest in it. They differed from the liberals, but they affirmed a common national interest. And so, part of what you're explaining beautifully is, in fact, there's a national interest. These are the national values. We're at our best as a nation when we see the humanitarian and the national game like this live together. So that's part of the pushback. But um, when you were talking about the census, <laughs> here's where we get down to the nitty the yeah, details. Yeah. There are a lot of people who are terrified of the census for good reasons. Why should they trust the state? Why should they make themselves legible when at this moment being legible means you are more likely to be deported, whether you're a citizen or not. There are potential citizens yeah. who would be deported yeah. and swept up in the race, right? So what do you say to somebody, a constituent or a resident constituent, who is skeptical of your, I totally agree, let me say yeah. that. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. want them to it's the same argument when I have when I'm trying to register a voter, who says, you know what, the system is rigged, why should I vote? And so what, what, it might be that. Like, what do you say to the, the skeptical constituent who doesn't want to fill out the census or who doesn't want to vote? Like, what's your argument? Okay, can I just, uh, so I, I actually think you have two things I want to address. The first is around the conversation around immigrants uh, and immigration. So when I worked at the National Immigration Forum, um, they are a national organization that does really amazing work in the immigration advocacy space. And they purposefully reach out to the center right because um, building a coalition with law enforcement, evangelical the evangelical Christian community mm. and uh, uh, so faith, law enforcement, and businesses. Um, because we cannot win immigration reform without yeah. votes on both sides. And so they have to lift up. They work very well and all the time with mm. the left, but also need to lift up the voices on the right that care about this. And the conversation then is mm. partly around the humanitarian issue, mm. but it's also for other reasons. It's for safety and the economics. Mm. And you have to be able to tell a full story about mm. why immigration is important. You have to know who your mm. audience is and what's gonna appeal to them. Mm. So sometimes it's that story about you know, mm. your neighbor next door, but it's also the fact, this happened to me last night, you know, mm. this um, a, a former refugee from Iraq came up to me and goes, I have a master's degree, but I, nobody recognizes that here, right? So you talk about the brain waste, you talk about the economic impact that people are having and all of that. So I think it is, a, you have to tell the full story mm -hmm. because for some people, yeah. the, you know, the gut wrenching, what is in your heart is just not gonna be enough. Yeah. Um, what do you say to people about why they shouldn't, people who are skeptical about voting and completing the census is um, particularly in voting where you say, you know, does my vote really count? There's like all these other people. Um, I mean, we in Virginia, I mean, we have a very concrete example where literally one more person who voted could have tipped the scale, right? Um, and you but you talk about like, 
If we had that one vote, right? If we had this one seat in Virginia, we would be 50-50. We would be in a power sharing agreement. We might not have had to make concessions on our Medicaid expansion and require work. We might have been able to, you know, like, and you, I think at the end of the day, and it's for the census too, and what I say when I knock on a door is, I'm Kathy Tran, I'm here to hear about the things, I'm here to hear about what you care about. What is it that is priority or concerns for you and your family? And you, when you know that on that one-on-one -on -one conversation, and that's the only way I think it can work for the skeptics, for anybody, right? That one-on-one -on -one conversation, then you say, Kelsey, like, I agree with you that women's health is really important. And when you fill out the census, it means like we're gonna be able to do X to talk about that. When you vote, you're making this statement about, you know, about making sure that we are protecting women's access to abortions. Because when you look at what's happening with the Supreme Court, that is legitimately, you know, a big concern that Roe v. Wade is gonna be overturned, right? Like you have to find out what people care about. And I think that's what motivates you. And so the conversations, if you're running for office that you have on the doors or when you're campaigning for other people, it's a unique conversation at every single door. And it's really about your, it starts off with your values and why you're there. Um, we, you know, and, and so we, um, <laughs> so now my family has really exciting family vacations and we went to Atlanta to campaign for Stacey Abrams and uh, with all four kids and we were all wearing our tie-dye shirts because I thought it would be fun and somebody was like, do you always dress alike? <laughs> no, but you can easily spot us on the street today. Um, but you know, I said to people like, I'm on vacation, I'm in Atlanta for one day and we're here to campaign for Stacey Abrams because she is amazing and what is it you care about? And this is why, this is what I care about. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily always like what Stacy cares about. This is why I am out here for this candidate, why I'm putting myself out here. And, and when you talk to those voters and skeptical about any of those issues, right? That's what you say. And it was so interesting. I had a, a voter actually write me a note. He goes, I don't know if you remember my conversation. I told you, we had this kid. Anyway, um, running around on the sidewalk. But he wanted to talk about Medicaid expansion and can we really do it? And we also talked a lot about gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and he wrote to me, he's like, you know, that's just amazing that we were able to pass Medicaid expansion and healthcare access in Virginia. Um, and like, you can have a conversation about the economics, you can have a conversation about the values, and it's all about what each individual person cares about. That's how you move people. So here's a question, yes. Um, thanks for coming back to you. Yeah. And um, I guess my question is, what experiences either at Duke or in your workplace have best informed Oh, I love Duke. Um, uh, we get my husband. And I get very nostalgic about Duke. Um, you know, we were both actually in the Heart Leadership Program, and that was a really important experience for us. Not just because we met each other there, but um, <laughs> but just kind of like opening eyes to what is possible in the world, right? A lot of when I was at Duke, so I'm at a class of 2000, and when I was here, a lot of the conversations about careers where I'm gonna go into iBanking, I'm gonna go into consulting. And so I went to an iBanking, like, you know, info session, and they were like, how many of you read the Wall Street Journal? And I was like, well, this is <laughs> I should just leave now, right? Um, so, you know, like, you, then you go through this gradual process to figure out what doesn't work. But what the Heart Leadership Program for us showed was just ways to get involved and give to a community and, um, to think about how to pursue career paths that line up with your values, right? Um, sometimes you're gonna have to have a job that because you need to pay your rent and you gotta make a certain amount of money in order to do that and take care of business that you have with your family and your home, right? Like that's just a fact of life and I learned that after I graduated too. But, um, but sometimes you're able to do that and marry that with something you really care about. And sometimes it's not about your work. Right? You go to work because you gotta pay your bills and you have a rich kind of extracurricular life where you're giving to mom's demand, where you're working on, you know, with a PTA or you're, you're in your place of worship where you're coaching or whatever it is. And that's how you're, you know, giving and finding value and getting engaged. Um, but, so I loved my experience at Heart Leadership. And also, uh, so Matt was like this tremendous student and I have the same degree as he does. But uh, uh, I like to say the other piece about Duke was just the people you meet, right? And I was telling you guys earlier when I, I remember my freshman, the first night of my freshman year, when we were sitting down and you get to know people in your hallway, I had one person who's like, I grew up in Togo, West Africa, who's like my best buddy. And then another person who's like, 
uh, my neighborhood just got its first stoplight this summer, right? And I grew up in Southern California. I was like, this is just fascinating, right? Mm -hmm. So the diversity of people and the experiences that they bring in those conversations were just instrumental to who I am today. Well, we are um, uh, out of the appointed time, I think. Um, um, gosh, what, this is just so, it's, you're, you're just awesome. It's just so <laughs> inspirational to me and probably to everyone here to, you know, to, uh, to feel great that they're, that you in particular, but they're people like you who are, you. you know, willing to step up and serve and, and who are involved in the, in the politics, you know, this wonderful combination of of analytics and heart, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, you, that you bring to the table. So thank you so much for well, sharing you for having me. Um, your thoughts today and for being here and for all you do. Thank you. So thank, thank you. you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you.